Warren Vanderhill interviewing Dr. John Hendricks, Emeritus Professor of Biology for the Ball State History Project, October 14, 2004. John, I want to thank you for agreeing to help me with my project. And I'd like to have you begin, if you would, telling me a little bit about your educational background before you came to Ball State, where you're from, where you went to college, et cetera. Originally born in Boston, Massachusetts, but uh, lost the Boston accent when I was about four and entered the public schools in a little town of Rochdale, Indiana, which is, you can't get there from here. <laughs> <laughs> and the first three years in, in Rochdale, then moved to Crawfordsville and finished the seventh grade in Crawfordsville and half the eighth grade and then moved to Greencastle, Indiana where I graduated from high school. I was engaged when I graduated, and I thought, well, you know, that was gonna be it, we are gonna get married. But she went on to college, and I decided, well, I'd go into service, because I didn't see how I could afford to go on to college. Although my father was a multimillionaire, mom and dad had separated and divorced many years before that. And he really didn't have much contact with myself or my brother. But unbeknownst to me, when I went down to Indiana State University and said, is there any financial aid, they started looking, and I had taken the state scholarship test and what have you, and I was at the top. She says, didn't your counselors at the school tell you anything? And they said, no. So I started selling shoes at, at Terre Haute and worked for Bill Hopp, God bless his soul, great man, great teacher. Everybody should have a mentor in higher education like Bill and worked in the lab 20 hours a week, and sold shoes during the gravy days, and had a scholarship, and eked my way through Indiana State. That's when a state school, like Indiana State and Ball State, you could do that. Right. <laughs> you can't, can't do it now. Yeah. Went up to Highland, Indiana, started teaching there. Loved it. Second year I taught there, I won the Outstanding Teacher Award. And it hooked me, both ego-wise and mission-wise. Uh, I taught there 10 years in the, with an interview, uh, intervening time of about two years, where I went back to Indiana State and finished my master's. And I came back as a science supervisor. As a science supervisor, uh, I was a member of the Indiana Science Supervisors Association and took the presidency of that the second year I came into it. There's only about 25 faculty members. But we formed HASTY, the Hoosier Association of Science Teachers, at that time. <coughs> and at the same time, the state science supervisor for the Department of Public Instruction asked if I'd be on the state science advisory committee, and I agreed. And Mim Ballou was on that committee. And Mim and I had got to be good friends on there, and she kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Come to Ball State, and we'll tailor make a program for you. We'll look at your weaknesses, we'll analyze them, and we'll tailor make a program for you. And after seeing what some of the other canned programs were like, I decided that's not wasn't a bad idea. And I came to Ball State in 1971. Uh, much to the influence of Mim, and after meeting Jerry Nesbitt, to his influence as well, too. Uh, finished the doctorate here in 73. And, well, it's actually 74, but I, I finished all the coursework and was just doing the rest of the dissertation. And during that year, Jerry Nesbitt said, you will work with Tom Mertens on a grant for NSF, and you will teach for me in that one, won't you? Jerry was a benevolent dictator. Yeah, right. <laughs> he really was. Yeah, yeah, I agree with him. <laughs> but I love the guy. And so he threw me in with a geneticist, and it was the only subject I ever had in higher education that I didn't like, was genetics. And I had Jolton Joe uh, Hennenberg, who was a colleague of Tom Mertens at Purdue. They knew each other pretty well. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that's, that story just went on and on and on. Tom and I found in each other colleagues that looked at each other's deficiencies, and as a team, we were hard to beat. I would agree. 
<laughs> a, di a dynamic duo. Since you have a kind of atypical way, I guess, of, of getting onto the Ball State faculty, once you became a faculty member, what were your expectations of the role of a faculty member at Ball State at that time? That's a very good question. My first love is teaching, effectively. My second love is biology as a discipline. And my third love is people. I'm a people person. Isolate me and I fall apart. Uh, my expectations were that I would have the freedom, number one, to do my thing. Uh, and that's what kept me at Ball State, because I had that freedom. As long as I produced the grants, brought in the students, did the publications, you know, I went through ranks in three years, which you couldn't do now, no matter what you did. Uh, but it was just, uh, it was a wonderful place. My expectations were always high. Of me. I, I, uh, I wasn't happy with second best and never had been. Well, you've also touched, I guess, on my second part of that question, but let me pose it specifically. Why did you stay here? You obviously had opportunities to do other things right. if you wanted to. I had tons. During my tenure at Ball State, I averaged probably two to three offers a year after I would reach a head reach full professorship. Uh, the grants were coming in, the articles were being published, and the national reputation was being developed. And science educators were as scarce as hen's teeth, still are. Uh, I mean, you just you just can't find them. And so, you know, they were they would go out and they'd actively recruit. Every time I went to yeah. NSTA uh, or NABT or any of the professional associations, I was just talked. Now, let's go out to dinner. I want to talk to you a little right. bit. And I knew what was coming. Sure. Yeah. But what kept me coming here and staying here was the was the promise that yes. You could do anything you wanted to do at Ball State as long as you were a productive faculty member. Okay. And, and that, that came to the point where uh, somebody by the name of Warren Vanderhill <laughs> asked my colleague Tom and myself if you'd develop a course for the honors kids that would meet their science requirements right. but also hold those that were not really scientifically minded. And that became the... the Bio 199 course, right. which later on became 299, the Human Genetics and Bioethics course. That course was a joy to teach. That was probably the second reason I stayed at Ball State. Okay. Okay. Because those kids were the kind of students that would learn in spite of you, <laughs> but they'd pull the best out of you if you really wanted to go. You know, I, I follow still some of their careers religiously. Uh, it, it's, uh, well, you know, you were being in the well, highest college. It, well, it was yeah. just, it was, I mean, I'm laughing about that because th there are three people, you, Tom Mertens, and me, that because I had invented the ID, which was the Family History 199 course, and I needed a science counterpart to it, you and Tom were kind enough to put it together, <laughs> that we had this amazing luxury, as I look back on that time in your life and mine, of teaching every honors college student who came to Ball State. Exactly right. <laughs> For 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so when, I, when I tell colleagues that I never taught these students here who weren't involved in the Honors College. And they say, you know, you really didn't teach at Ball State. And I said, well, I guess in some ways I get you to say Well, that. I still had a couple of courses yeah, every once did. in a while, and then I would have my graduate courses, but then right. the graduate courses are, are yeah. comparable, too. So there was a satisfaction in what I was doing, who I was working with, mm -hmm. uh, and there was still the freedom to do <coughs> the things in the summer that I wanted to do. Okay. Th think more now on the macro level, and reflect a bit on ways that Ball State changed during your time as a faculty member. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, where do you start? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I came here in 71, was on faculty in 73, and from 73 to 98, uh, I was a faculty member of Ball State. And during that time was a massive growth and change from a teacher's college, really, to a, to a university that was a fledgling university to a university that can really call itself a university. Uh, that's mega change. And the mega change, when you think about 25, 30 years uh, of that kind of involvement, 
always holding our accreditation. And thanks to a lot of administrative leadership, had the foresight to say our primary mission, no matter which way you cut it, is to be a teaching scholar. That is to teach well and to know your discipline well and carry out your research. The Office of Research uh, took a role in leading uh, in a different direction and saying that this campus and the, the faculty we have on this campus can do a great deal of applied research. That ought to be our forte, and it turned out to be mine, at least. Uh, yeah. So the changes that I saw were changes in clientele, a better clientele coming all the time because the standards were being raised all the time. Uh, a change in faculty. The change in faculty brought more discipline scholars to the campus and less teaching scholars yeah. to the campus. And that became difficult as a science educator in an academic department because uh, I love the people that I work with. They were great people, and any time I had a discipline question, I could go to them with no problem at all. But the antithesis wasn't true until near the end of my career. And then I started mentoring some faculty that came in with outstanding academic credentials but couldn't teach the way I could be or bad. Uh, and that became a lot of fun yeah. for me. Uh, that little niche of having the discipline educators within the academic department, whoever set that up, was a sharp cookie. Because from that came course syllabi with measurable objectives, right. tests with measurable objectives and accountability, uh, teacher evaluation forms that were meaningful and not pablum. I mean, I could just I could go down the line uh, because all of us were all of us who were educators in a discipline uh, used to get together once in a while on campus. Then a few of the people who were just during good scholarly teachers, like John Barber, uh, we used to have our cheese and wine Fridays in right. which uh, we chew over you know, what's going on. So yeah, there were some other things that happened during that time that were really signs of, uh, to me, that the institution wanted to keep its focus on quality teaching. The Office of Teaching uh, and Learning, uh, the, the accountability thing that was led by Columba, Catherine, Catherine. Uh, was on that committee with Barber and three others that were just outstanding faculty members looking at all the accountability data, uh, looking at how we measure the situation. The involvement, first of all, going through a good assessment of the general studies program, but not as strong as it should have been, in my opinion. And then the next jump, as you're going through it again right now, right. and I hope they go back and they read some of the good literature that says what a general studies program is supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, let, me, let me try a couple specific things. I did. Did it have much impact you that impact on you as a faculty member that we change from quarters to semesters? Although I was very resistant to it at first. Uh, and, you know, you when you develop a course on a quarter system, you're it's ten weeks, and man, you've got to right. push, push, push the whole time. Right. And ours was an accountability course, as you well know, that had a good, strong accountability model, and right. pre-post tests, weekly quizzes, you know, all kinds of study sessions for the honors kids. I mean, when you push those kids, to, they're such great worshippers; they'll 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 do it. Right. Sure. Even a lab for for twenty years right. that course when it was a three-hour course, taught out of our height. Right, right. But we felt strongly enough that a science course should have a lab. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what the hell was your question? <laughs> I hope you're going to edit this. Well, the, the, the <laughs> My Tourette's came well, through. The question was, well, we, we have, you know, all the, let's say, uh, University Senate jumping up and down about uh, changing the calendar from quarters to semesters, as you will recall. We uh, went through it once and it didn't pass. We went through it a second time and didn't pass. Went through it a third time when, during John Worthen's presidency, and even though it didn't pass the University Senate, John Worthen said, oh, that's close enough, and went ahead and did it. Yeah. 
and, I, and in some disciplines, I think that had a dramatic effect, and others people don't seem to think it was much of a change at all. Well, for my frame of reference, and I guess it's because I've always had a frame of reference from a student's point of view, and being a poor person at, when I went through school, yeah. it was easier to make the tuition for a quarter oh, on a working situation than it was. And that, and that was something that I had students talk to me not knowing how they were going to do it, mm -hmm. uh, and it bothered me. But as far as the switch, once I, I remodified the curriculum, and was in it for a year, two full semesters, I thought, yeah, I now have the time to do, and particularly the bioethical decision-making course, which is my graduate course, what should have been done. It was too rushed in, in the quarter system. So there were some advantages I began to see. Okay. Didn't see them at first, but after I got my feet wet into it, because I went to a school that was on the quarter system, right. Right. and I came to a school that was on right. the quarter system to teach. Right. The time I taught on a semester system is when I taught at IU. Well, an another one that I think is interesting in terms of significant changes during your time as a faculty member, and you've touched on a little bit, but that would be the period in the 1980s when Ball State dramatically changed its way of assessing people for uh, the progress to an attainment of tenure or promotion to associate with Ball and introduced uh, merit pay uh, and I know that everybody was affected by that in one way or another. And I Very much so. I wonder if you would comment on how <laughs> that affected you. Well, in 82, I had the Outstanding Teaching Award here with one of your colleagues, was to was share with Tony. Uh, I had the, it was in 83, I had the NABT honorary member. And a couple things were coming my way pretty heavy situation to where people in my department had a great deal of respect for me. It was a kind of a turnaround. You know, I didn't know for eight years from teaching here that Jerry Nesbitt forced the department to hire me. I had no idea of that. Uh, that came as a real shock to me. I was very unhappy when I heard it. That was a, that was a bad week when I heard that situation, because I didn't realize that, that it took me that long. I thought it was because I was in education, and not in this one, but I'll match them this one concept. Because my master's is straight biology right. masters, and uh, yeah. but that that was a shock. But. Needless to say, the accountability thing that was coming in was something that I, I was welcome 100% because it was a way to facilitate competency in teaching. And I already said earlier on that as this metamorphosis was going on, we were bringing in good scholars, the people that had limited teaching experience, and some even from industry, but working with them and seeing the format of how they were going to be evaluated and student feedback and evaluations, people who have been in industry like Claire, man, beautiful teacher, yeah. wonderful, right. caring person, you know, right. Tom Lauer, sure. just, yeah. you know, I mean, and so you can just kind of just come down the line that it was fearful for a lot of people uh, with regard to teacher evaluation, but the merit system, from my frame of reference, the way it was implemented, forced. Uh, and I can say that because I had the highest merit every single year in the department. <clears throat> but one of our deans, who was an ex-nun, now you know who I'm talking about, uh, when the board had suggested that we go 50-50, and we were only 15%, which is all the board had right. mandated, right. Uh, there was a quite a young discussion by some very young, dynamic, good faculty strong academicians who became very good teachers, but at that time weren't. And I finally looked one of them right in the face. I said, you don't want to raise the night yet. Because I'll guarantee you when you do this, 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 and this, and you bring in this kind of money on grants and you do these things, you know, then maybe you can take some money out of my pocket. Until then, I'm taking it out of yours. <laughs> and Dave, shut up. <laughs> And so your department has remained 85-15. Ever since. To this day. They're the only one, they I think. Are. It, huh? 
Yeah, they still are. Yeah. yeah as far as I know. And when, when you look at all these changes that occurred like during your long and distinguished career, do you see them as as positive or negative as far as the entire university is concerned? I see most of them as very positive. Okay. I only wish the role of the professoriate had really been implemented. When you brought in here and you looked at the changing role as, as a scholar matures in his or her profession, right. from the young faculty member that's, you know, the young PhD that right. usually doesn't know how to teach to yeah. getting into a scholarly, doing his research, beginning his publication, learning how to teach, uh, to the old sage that's got three or four or five more years on campus, mm -hmm. who could be so wonderfully used. I hate to say it that way, it sounds yeah, usury, sure. but I really think that somehow the campus missed the boat on not making that a model for Ball State because we would have been so far ahead, yeah. in my opinion, in higher education in the state that nobody would have touched us. Yeah, yeah. That's, good. That's a good point. You mentioned Jerry Nesbitt and Tom Mertens. Are there other people who had a particular impact on you? Oh, yeah. For good or ill. <laughs> Don, Don about, yeah. Jones was my confidant oh, okay. in Teachers College. God rest his soul. He was a great man. Uh, I could always count on, on calling Don and get the truthful answer. Uh, well, there were several people on this campus over the years. Susan Johnson and I became very good friends. I recommended Susan for hiring. I interviewed her, and, and uh, Susan is a quiet giant. Her intellect is just hard to, to talk. And Susan and I became workers sometimes <laughs> clandestinely on certain projects, but it was important. Uh, even though Jerry, Jim Pyle rather, uh, drives me nuts, as long as you were really producing, he was very, very helpful. Uh, Jim Ballou, while she was still here, was, was a strong advocate. Uh, Dennis Redburn, believe it or not. Oh. Oh. My neighbor. <laughs> and Dennis, uh, Dennis would, would call it pretty straight. Mm -hmm. So there's, there was a lot of people. That's the one thing, the, another thing that Ball State missed the boat on. If there had been a faculty club on this <laughs> campus where the faculty could have just yeah. mingled rather than yeah. just knowing the people that you either work sure. with on doctoral committees yeah. or on, on university committees, uh, you, you meet a few like that, but yeah. you're just there with your, with your, you're isolated. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and to have more of a social interaction with mm -hmm. peers yeah. would strengthen the general studies program. Uh, to me, the general studies teachers ought to be meeting on a regular basis to really take a look at what the right hand and the left hand are doing. Those are, those are just some mm -hmm. suggestions I would make that, yeah, I, that I think right. that uh, yeah. we really strengthen what's going on here. Yeah, I want to go back to a point you mentioned a little while ago. One of the things that's fairly atypical about Ball State is that the people who teach courses, uh, like the courses you taught, uh, and some of your colleagues in biology, are in biology. They're not in teacher's college. People right. teach social studies, social studies methods in this department are not in teacher's college. And as you probably know, when NK would come around every once in a while to do their uh, reaccreditation of our teacher ed programs, that one of the things that they used to get on me about as provost during that time I was in that position was that we had these <laughs> faculty, these outlanders, <laughs> yeah, who were in the history department, the math department, the biology department, et cetera. And, and you touched on that as a real strength of Ball State University, and I think it was a real strength. But Massive I guess, strength. Well, I guess I, I'm asking you as somebody who really understands this far better than, than I ever understood why that was a particular strength. Why not two have things. all of you people in the teacher's college? Oh, oh, two things. A person in that position in an academic department learns the academics and then imparts the teaching skills. Okay. The two combinations give you as an individual a place to grow like you wouldn't believe. If somebody would have told me when I finished my master's I'd end up teaching genetics at the college level, I would have told them it's crazy. I, I'm a zoo man. I really love zoology, right. and particularly invertebrate zoology. Right. Uh, 
I feel as comfortable teaching uh, genetics, any level that genetics is taught on this campus. Okay. Uh, because I literally picked up the biochemistry stuff that sure. I needed for the advanced gen. Uh, I love okay. teaching the human genetics because of, of its humanistic nature. But it was, yeah. So you see it as a real strength. Oh, I see it. I see it as, I don't know who decided that, but I, it, was I the, it was the most, yeah. well, it was a gift. It kept me here, yeah. for one thing. Sure. And, and secondly, you get a bunch of people who are trained to teach a discipline mm -hmm. and put them all together and take them away from the discipline, they lose their zest. Because now they're just dealing with the pedagogy and not the content. Uh, you know, they don't, many of them don't read the professional journals in the content area. Uh, they're still all wrapped up in the pedagogy. Okay. The pedagogy only is a means to an end. Well, this may be a blunt question, but did you ever feel that because you were the education person in a department like biology that you were a second-class citizen? At first, yes. Okay. But that wasn't the reason that I felt that way, I found out late. Right. When I found out that Jerry had said, you will hire him, and actually wrote the job description to fit only one person, and that was me. Uh, yeah. I didn't realize what what problems that created because, you know, they saw me as, a, as an educator. Right. Yeah. Right. Even though my MS in biology didn't make much difference to them and my hardcore research in yeah. protozoology didn't make much difference to them. It was, it was, it was their perceptions. Okay. And that's a terrible perception on a lot of campuses. Yeah. There are some great scholars uh, who are educators. Uh, they get a bad rep because of of a few of them that are really damn lazy. Yeah, well, I think that's true. Okay, um, tell me a little bit about your special areas of involvement in the university. Beyond the teaching and research and scholarship, we have this wonderful category that we call service. And okay. everybody's involved in it to some degree or another, but I know that you've been particularly involved in it. Yeah, but in a different way. Well, that's true, yeah. A really different way. Yeah. What, what was that? PPC, Professional Policy yes, Council. Yes, PPC. Yeah, right. I had my first, <laughs> my first baptism <laughs> into the politics of higher education in PPC, which was a mammoth group, uh -huh. having representatives from every department on campus and the administrative staff. And it was at the end of my tenure on that service that I decided I would never again go for faculty senate or any anything faculty wise, and I would keep my service areas to my profession and on <coughs> campus to the department and that's what i did okay <laughs> i mean i was on every p and t committee you can imagine yeah. i was on every you know <laughs> search and selection committee on all that stuff yeah. it, it, it looks good on the vita yeah. uh and, and move through the promotion thing but that's not why i did it uh the curriculum committee on the department was my favorite and i served on it for almost 18 years and that time we were able to get standardizations in the course syllabi and a lot of other things that really have impact uh, on, on the campus and on the, on the teaching and on the department in general. And then nationwide, I took national offices and organizations and that, you know, so you, big so you always were involved in your national organization? Oh, state and national. Okay. And I nurtured H.G. Abel. There were 25 of us that started. And not H.G. Abel, I the Hastings, the right. Association of Science Teachers. Uh, there were 25 of us that started it, and now it is the third largest uh, science teacher organization in the country. Uh, and good membership, great people, good conventions. Uh, we'll have the national NSTA, we're affiliated with NSTA, right. uh, convention in Indianapolis, one of them, uh, wow. the regional, coming up this fall. Uh, but that was, a, that was a joy to watch that grow. Mm -hmm. But then I went into NABT and became a director at large for three different elections in turn. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Mertens was president of NABT right. at one year. And when I saw what he had to do on the conventions and the stuff, I decided that wasn't <laughs> what I really wanted to spend my time doing because I did it halfway with him the whole damn year and would not stand for election to, to president. Then. But, yeah, my service component uh, involved more than that. The summer, the summer grants 
for all these teacher training grants through right. NSF. And my obligation to those teachers was not just hi and goodbye. The thing that kept, that kept us going year after year was the extensive evaluation and follow-up, which the National Academy of Science in their yearbook wrote up Ball State as one of the three top accountability projects in the country. Uh, in their publication called Science for All Americans. And <clears throat> it was because we followed up. We, I mean, I was on the road. Tom could not fly because of his, his science problems and allergy problems. And I was on the road. We teach here on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and leave Wednesday afternoon, visit classes from someplace in the country on Thursday and Friday. And we're going to catch up workshop on Saturday for those teachers and fly back on Sunday. And that, that was a, a period of about seven years in my life that went like that. Pretty demanding. It was. Uh, but it ended up uh, with a service component that I can't quantify like hours on the committee, right. but I can quantify it with impact nationwide because I've got teachers out there that have written their own grants, that are in their own human genetics workshops, uh, that have taken over state roles. I've got two teachers that are reforming the teacher education network in the state of Vermont, which is small enough to be able to do that. It's the only place in the United States where teachers control their own certification. and. Uh, that was something I was harping on for a long time. I said, you want to be a profession, you act like a profession. <laughs> How about in the community, in the Muncie community? You've been involved with some very areas heavy. there? Very heavy. Uh, I'm an RC, as you know, and that's not a Royal Crown Cola. That's a <laughs> Roman Catholic. <laughs> and I've been very involved with the Newman Center okay. uh, from day one yeah. here, uh, teaching adult religion classes, teaching high school religion classes, and preaching heresy. <laughs> you and Jim Kirkwood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jim's a great man. Yeah. But we, a lot in a service situation. I still am in a service situation in this community. I sit on the board of directors of the Y here in town. And two days ago, I said yes to something I probably shouldn't have said yes to, but did. I'm going to be the co-chair of the Jennings Advisory Committee for the State Board of Health, working with Dr. Patricia Baker, MD, who was the first one I went up, lived at the nurse's dorm for my first sabbatical at Parkview Hospital in Fort Wayne, and, and Pat took me under hand, and she's a medical geneticist and made the discipline live for me. And when you have all those personal experiences, you know, and you can relate those to kids, Makes, makes a discipline yeah, yeah. really really personal yeah, it really does but what, what's your perspective on the, the role of the faculty at Wall State well I think it ought to be tiered okay number one I think to expect faculty to do all things equally well all the time in a career is too damn ambitious I think we ought to take young faculty that just come fresh out of their doctoral programs and we ought to help them with a good mentoring system. And I, I'd almost like you to turn off that tape recorder for the things I'd like to say, but <laughs> I, I think that uh, we ought to have a mentoring system in place for those young faculty. We ought to have a system which, which pairs people up, literally, to teach them how to publish and to write, we ought to teach them, uh, we ought to make connections for them. Like when, when Susan Johnson came in and took her job here, within 45 minutes I had her talking to Jerry Coglazer at the state, saying she'd make an excellent person to put on the Science Advisory Committee for the Department of Public Instruction. She was on the very next right. year when there was a vacancy available. You introduce people, you bring them in, and, and you move them. Uh, in important directions. The middle tier of faculty, as long as they're doing their thing, teaching well, and carrying out their scholarly role, and working 
in the service roles in the department because that's where the workforce sure. jobs ought to be. Right. The younger ones are here. Right. The ones sitting up here, maybe in certain cases don't give a damn, but could be well used down here. Uh, but there's there's the bulk of the work. So I, I really I really should look at that changing role of the professoriate and say that if it had been implemented, uh, it would have made a big difference. What so about, that's what I see there. What about the the voice of the faculty and, and governance that we hear so much about? Uh, do you think the faculty has had a, an appropriate voice in decision making at Wall State? <laughs> the joke when I was, remember I told you I stayed out of the, the yeah. university level, but the joke in the, in the department was, We'll work really hard on that, and they'll do what they damn well please. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was generally the tenor of the feeling. Okay. Accurate or, or not, that was the tenor of the feeling. That was the perception of people. Uh, because of certain actions of certain deans, uh, that became pretty obvious that you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything, so you didn't shake. You just did what you wanted to do. Yeah. And as long as they, you know, you could always plead ignorance. Gee, I didn't know I was supposed to ask to do that. <laughs> and go ahead. And that's exactly what I did. Well, do you think, as you look back, that the faculty may have had a greater voice in decision making if we had a faculty senate instead of a university senate? I'm really not sure. Okay. Uh, Probably better if we had a faculty club. I think we would have had more decision making. Well, I agree with you about that. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I think that <clears throat> sometimes the formal nature mm -hmm. of either a Senate, uh, any, any kind of an organization is set up like that. The formalities and the rules and regs that are established to keep the organization going sometimes stand in the way in real productive change in decision making. Okay. And, and I think sometimes a social atmosphere with some collegiality can do a heck of a lot more, yeah. on, okay. even to changing perceptions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know whether the perceptions were accurate or not. Uh, I would talk to the people that represented us in the department, and if there was issues that concern me, I, I, I took my stance on those. Uh, and I know from the hard work of some of the people who filled in those roles that they represented us very well. How about the relationship between the campus and the community, what's usually called the town and the gown? I think it's uh, an ever-evolving, but still a distant relationship. Okay. Do you think I'm, it's better now than it was when you first came here? I'm not sure what the things that have happened in the last few years. Okay. I think that it was. It was getting better. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know all the hullabaloo that's going on at Prairie Creek Campground right now. I have it. I can't. I camp out there. Okay, but I'm not going to next year. Yeah. But I called the mayor, uh -huh. and I said to him, Mayor, I said, you know, if you have everybody move off that place, why don't you use some of the resources you've got right in your own backyard? Get some of the senior architect majors to come out there yeah. and look at that thing and yeah. map it out for you. Sure. He called, and they're going to. Oh, that's uh, a step in the right direction. Yeah, and I yeah. just, you know, he said, I never thought of that, and that. That tells the story, to your question right now to me, is that there's still that distance. That Ball State's out there, we love you because you bring in money, revenue, and stability, yeah. but you're there and we're here. Mm -hmm. And you, you think there's a reluctance on the part of the community, the city fathers, if you will, to call on us to offer the expertise that we have out here? Creative. Oh, okay. Oh. Academicians and politicians and local people uh, they have an inborn fear. And just look what happened on this quote unquote liberalism smear, well, uh, which yeah. they're all willing to buy. Yeah, well, just like that. Yeah. I've spent the last three weeks yeah. at the Y saying, I'll oh, cut it yeah. out. You know, Ball State's a conservative. Can't. Yeah, I mean, you didn't see any Kent State out here shooting around. You didn't see a lot of stuff. Ball State, relatively speaking, is a pretty conservative mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, they don't believe me. Well, I recall that in the Ball State book that Tony Evans and Bruce Gilbert published, that Tony, who was part of this at the time, or keeps 
referring to what I think he calls the, the Ball State 7, that back in the late 60s, early 70s, when other campuses were coming apart, there were seven people at Ball State who protested everything. <laughs> you know, and you're right, and over, you're, over time this is a very, very conservative. Very, very conservative. Yeah, I would agree. You just haven't seen that kind of uh, discourse. Okay. Any, anything else you'd like to add? Because that was my last question, so. Feel free to add any final reflections or comments. Yeah, I'm fine. No, I got, yeah, I'm doing an interview. I got to call you back. What's your number? Wait, wait, wait. 747. I'd just like to thank the administration of Ball State <laughs> during my tenure here. I'd like to thank the opportunities that they allowed me. Uh, I believe that Ball State, generally speaking, has had outstanding administrators. They've led the university in directions that it ought to have gone, in my opinion. Uh, it isn't all of them, to say all of them that way, but that when you have a majority that are all thinking alike and are all working for a common goal, you know, this book. This institution didn't have a mission except teaching mm -hmm. right. until the involvement. And then that mission right. statement that was written, and it wasn't just words on paper. I really believe that the administration looked at that mission statement and said, yes, that is what we're heading about, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. what we're about. Uh, and I appreciate that as a member. I, that's part of the reason I stayed. Mm -hmm. So thank you for allowing me to spill off my you. guts for a little bit. I appreciate it. You are always welcome. And all you gotta do is teach me how to fly fish. I'm I leaving, will. you know. I'm going to fly fishing next week. Well, you'll be all set once we get this club stuff going. I thank you very much for the interview. Oh, my pleasure.